Praise God. Us, we're celebrating. You may be seated. Man, thank the Lord for the truth of that. That's why we celebrate today. And even as we turn, I want you to turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. We continue uh, the the series that we're in. I want you to know that, that the hope of every person, of every family is what we just sang. Death was arrested. New life has begun. Aren't you thankful for that, church? That's what we're celebrating this morning, guys. Yeah, you can, you can clap for that. Let's do it, man. No golf clap here, man. Family of God redeemed, set free. Praise God for this. Well, I'm excited about what we have in store today. And I'm just going to tell you, man, uh, every, every September, October, all the way through December, people start coming back to church. And so, have you noticed it's a little bit tighter here in this service? Uh-huh. Uh huh. Well, here's the thing. Um, I'm just going to tell you that 8:30 service that they're actually going to, but there's a little more room there. So if you want to watch, you're like, man, I'm I'm not sitting with my entire family today. Well, hey, just show up. 8:30 service. We even have uh, we're, we're opening up uh, kids again through. Uh, through uh, Let's see, newborn to kindergarten next, uh, next week. And we're doing that because, honestly, we do have a great problem, but we are growing. And so be kind. I, I, uh, this is not on my notes. <laughs> be kind to your parking team. <laughs> Because what I have found, getting in and getting out sometimes is crazy here. So just remember, it's a good problem. People are meeting Jesus. We're gathering to worship Jesus. It's a great thing. So it is great to have you here. Now, I'm going to do real quick before I jump into our message. I, I, I want to say something. I, I just had this harebrained idea end of the week. I've been talking to a lot of we have a lot of nurses, doctors, um, people that, uh, man, are making a difference here in our community that I've been talking to over the last couple of weeks. And, and guys, we need to pray for our nurses and our doctors here in our community. They are being overwhelmed right now. And I, I want us, in fact, w- would you commit to pray with me for our nurses and doctors? Would you do that? Let's pray for them. I want you to take it a step further, though. We, I, I got this idea. I as you exit through the middle doors across from our missions wall, we've got a couple tables set up there. And, and I want to challenge you to take a card with you. And what we're going to do, we're going to collect, we're, we're even providing the cards where you write a note to, uh, man, to, to those that are on the front lines here in our community with this COVID spike. And just let them know, so I'm praying for you, encourage them, do something. If you want to slide in like a, a $5 Starbucks gift card or something like that, you do whatever God lays in your heart. But what we're going to do, I want you to take a card with you, write the note, bring it back no later than Wednesday. If you can bring it back by Wednesday. We're going to be distributing them at St. Luke, St. Al's, uh, West Valley, uh, d- different other places here in our community. And so I, I just, this is a time where we can, you got to remember, we are not just a church in our city, we are a church for our city. And this is the opportunity, us, opportunity for us to be the body of Christ and to pray for and encourage those who need it during this time. And so, man, thank you guys for watching. you're going to do. So just grab that after service. Now, you know, in Genesis chapter three, we're going to be taking the next step in this family series. And, you know, have you, have you guys ever uh, been tempted to buy into one of those magic diets? You know, like you can lose 30 pounds in 30 days. First of all, that's probably not like a healthy thing. I, I don't know. But, but, you know, it's like, hey, yeah, it's worth a shot. You take like the pill or whatever. And I don't know, you know, it's like, we're all looking for the silver bullet. Like, I, I mean, What's the quickest way to knock this out? Like, uh, one, one, one day I saw a commercial for, it's been a while ago, uh, P90X. Anybody hear of that fitness program, P90X? And dude, I, I like saw the picture of the guy, and I'm like, yeah, man. I can do this. I got the DVDs. <laughs> and so if you don't know what P90X is, it's like they have a video, and it's like, I don't know. It's like everybody that's been through SEAL training, apparently. Like, <laughs> and, you're, and they're like on the TV, and they're doing their thing, and, you, and you're like in your, in your family room or, or you know, living room. You're supposed to be doing it with you. So like, I got the videos, and I'm setting it up. I got my, my resistance bands. It's like, okay, let's do this. And literally, like within two minutes into the video, I'm like, I'm dead. And they hadn't even started exercising yet. He was just telling us what we're going to do that day. And I'm already like, like, dude, I don't think I can do this. And so, like, I did it for two days. And, they, and, and I, there was no way I could keep up. Like, three minutes, I'm like, 
you know, and, 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 and they said, you, you know, they're like, you can modify. Like their modification would kill a normal, everyday person. And like some of you are like, what are you talking about? Listen, dude, I see you. You got your six pack. Listen, I'm enjoying my keg here. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> what killed me, what, what I realized was when I looked, I finally got the box. And like after two days, like, I don't know if I can do this. And I looked at the back of the box and the picture that I had seen that I was admiring was actually the before picture. It wasn't even the after picture. I'm like, <laughs> there's no way I could be that guy. But I was convinced, man, if I take, I get this, in, in, in all seriousness, here's the deal. You do, you, you put in the workout, you're going to get results. But it doesn't happen overnight. We're always looking for the silver bullet. I know that today I'm talking to people, perhaps there is dysfunction in your family. It might not be your immediate family, maybe it's your extended family, things that exist between siblings, kids, grandkids. It, perhaps is even within your marriage. And you are hoping that in this family series you've been looking for, we're going to get the silver bullet. It's going to happen. Not going to happen, sorry. (laughs) However, that being said, though, there is no silver bullet that just clears up everything and puts everything back together in a moment's time. That's not to say there's not a solution, because there is. And we're going to look at that But what we're going to see is that this problem within our marriage is not always what we think it is. So last week we were in Genesis chapter 2 and we looked at how God ordains marriage and he brought Adam and Eve together and it was was just one of those sappy sermons, you know, like, oh, that's awesome, you know. I even got a, I even got a dog on mother-in-laws and father-in-laws and, like, people resistant, you know. I had a mother-in-law come up to me. He's like, yeah, the only reason you're saying that because your kids aren't married yet. I'm like, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. But, you know, we, we talked about it. We're just digging and seeing what the Word of God says. But we move from Genesis chapter 2 where it's talking about uh, the, the first wedding. We get to Genesis chapter 3. Now, I got to give you a little context because if you got to go, you got to go back to Genesis chapter 2 before Eve is created. God has this conversation with Adam. And, and in essence, he said, Parad- I've given you paradise. I've given you this, and, and this, this is for you. But he, he tells him in, in verses 16 through 17, we find this. He says, of the tr- but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. You can eat off of any tree. You can do whatever. From this tree, though, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so the first eight verses of Genesis chapter 3 break down what took place. It's actually a very tragic story. Actually, it's the first seven verses. We're going to pick up our reading in verse 8. In which they're both tempted, and we see how they disobeyed God. There's no other way of, of getting around it. They rebelled against God. They sinned. Eve was deceived, and she rebelled against God and her sin by taking the fruit that she knew she wasn't to take. Adam sinned passively. We're going to see this. He, he just sat there. He was with her when she was tempted, as she was deceived. And, and then he didn't just watch it happen. He ate of the fruit as well. And then we see God showing up. In verse, verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now, remember, we're we're going to come back to this, but remember last week, we we ended by by saying, you know, verse 25 said that, that Adam and Eve were both naked and were not ashamed. That was, that was important. I talked a little bit about that. Well, here, Adam's like, yeah, the reason we hid, we're, we're naked, and so we were ashamed, and so God asked, I think it's a very relevant question, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? <laughs> Listen to this. Man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. What a weasel. <laughs> Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And, and I want you to leave your Bibles open. We're going we're to come back. But I just want I, I to do something today. It's very interesting to me 
that we see the first sin happening within the context of marriage. Now, is this this big significance? I, I, once again, I told you last week, Scripture begins with a marriage in Genesis. It ends with a marriage in Revelation. There's, there's a whole lot of in-between, but a lot of this comes back. It's interesting that, that the serpent did not deceive Adam when he was alone. You see, Satan has always been about dividing what God has put together. And there is a deception, and I believe that there is something we need to understand we're looking for the silver bullet, put my marriage back together. Let's, let's get rid of all this fighting and, and trouble, the dysfunction of family. Let's, man, what do I have to do? Is there a pill I can take? Is there some easy thing? Can I go to one counseling session? You know, that's it. One counseling session and get it worked out. No, no. no see, see, our issue is, is going to be something. I'm, I'm just going to tell you, this is going to be a little bit different. You probably never heard a marriage message in this context. But we've got to understand the problem of sin. And there are four things that I want us to understand about sin this morning within this context of family, within this context of marriage. The first thing I want us to understand is is this. I want us to grasp the heart of sin. The heart of sin. Sin is willful rebellion against God. It's it's when we, we actually long for and take the rights that only he can have where we put our, we try to sit on his throne and pick up his scepter and wear his crown and say, we know best, we're going to do what we want to do. There is, there is sin and there is, a, there is definitely a, a vertical aspect of sin in, 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 in which we do this, in which we refuse to submit and bow to God's rule. What we do not understand is that, that in this, the, these days of, of perhaps easy grace in which we have actually trampled on what true grace is really all about, we're like, ah, God's okay with me doing what I want to do. He's not. He's not. He's not. But it's not just that there's a vertical aspect to this, and we're going to break this down here in just a couple of minutes. There's also this horizontal aspect to sin in which we sin against each other. There there is sin that happens against each other, and and we've all seen this. We've all seen this, especially in a family. Listen, when it it comes to, to this, sin results in a willingness to throw anyone else under the bus to justify myself. Well, I don't know what's going on here, but the problem isn't me. If you, if you, but if, remember when, it's always this, this let's throw them under the bus in which we are, we are, we are obsessed with justifying ourselves. We are obsessed. We have to be right. We have to be, feel superior to others. Even, listen, I'm talking about even with spouses, with kids, all of this sort of thing. We have to exploit them. We have to expose them. It's, our, it's us convincing ourselves, I'm better than you, so that makes me okay. And this is toxic in marriage. This is toxic in a family. Instead of being teammates who are doing this together, we become competitors. I mean, I just, I read it, <laughs> Adam, the woman whom you gave to be with me. Isn't that crazy? I mean, like chapter two, Adam's like, yeah, this is what I've been looking for all my life. Man, I, you know, he's breaking forth into song. Oh, this is amazing. They get called on their sins like, well, hey, I didn't ask for it. You gave her to me, man. I, I was not in on this. <laughs> he's thrown God out of the bus. Not only that, man, he just, just, man, just drives right over Eve. Yeah, I, I, love, I love the whole, you know, run around naked without any shame, but you blow it, sister, you're on your own, girl. <laughs> now, what we, 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 we see at, at, the, at the heart of this, at the heart of this is, is this, it's not my fault. It's her fault. It's his fault. God turns to Adam, he calls him on it, he throws Eve under the bus. Eve didn't have anybody to throw under the bus except the serpent, so he turns to Eve and she's like, well, 
the serpent deceived me. And by the way, like, like I'm going to tell you right now, like if, if a snake starts talking to you, can we just say, like there are two animals that will, if, if a snake or a cat talks to you, they will lead you astray. Just don't listen. I mean, just come on. But no, at the, at the heart of, of sin is this phrase, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. But I don't want us to just understand the heart of sin. I want us to understand the width of sin because what I'm talking about is, is, is the reality that, that has, has hurt our marriages. We're all sinners. We're all born in sin. Like, I mean, you came out and you were a wrinkled, red, little screaming sinner. There is, that's just who we are. It doesn't matter your class, your, your gender, your, you know, how much money you make. It, it does not matter. We're all we're all born sinners. It's touched every one of us. And what we don't understand, there, 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 are, so many, there are so many times that, that we don't understand what, this, what the impact this has on a marriage. Because we go into marriage, I talked about this last week, with certain assumptions. And for a lot of us, we're like, it's going to be paradise. You and me, honey, we do this. It is going to be heaven on earth. And it's not. Like, it's not. And you're like, well, you must have a terrible marriage. No, I have a great marriage. I'm just telling you, we both are jacked up. And so are you. In fact, if you're sitting by your spouse, I know everybody's not married or sitting by but if you're sitting by your spouse, would you just look over at them right now? Just look deeply into their eyes. Look, no, seriously, it's like a romantic moment here. Um, and I'm gonna ruin it because you're looking at a sinner right now. That's what you're doing. Listen, we have issues, and, and they begin to manifest themselves. We never, I remember, I was, I was conducting a wedding, and in the, in, the, in the ceremony, as the two were standing there, I remember saying some comment about, you know, there's going to come that point when you guys are going to butt heads or whatever, and the guy, the groom, actually said, it's never going to happen. And I literally, I just stopped and said, you have a lot to learn. I, I'm just telling you right now. <laughs> And it's not that it just manifests in stupid things like where are we going to spend the holidays, you know, what side of the family gets why, you know, those, those, those crazy things. I, I'm talking about it begins to manifest itself. And, and what happens is there becomes this, this distance that, 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 that develops. But, but, but here's, here's my point is this. We all bring baggage into a marriage. And, and, and what I know is that there's sin and this loss of intimacy. It's because maybe we were sinned against and that impacts our marriage. Maybe it's, it's, it's sin that we've done in the past or maybe even within the marriage we're, we're covering up the sin, the shame, whatever the case happens to be. There is a width of sin. It impacts all of us in some way. But it goes beyond that. The, the third thing I want us to understand is there's a depth to this. There's a depth of sin. And if we don't consider the depth of sin, always, it's always going to be, it's not my fault. The other person is the enemy. Listen to me. We have enemies, but it's not who you think, that it, who you think it is. You see, your wife or your husband is not an obstacle to be removed or an opponent to be conquered. This is not the purpose of marriage, but too, far too often, this is what is taking place. You see... Every single relationship is impacted and touched and destroyed by my sin and your sin. You're like, man, what a terrible day to show up to Grace Bible Church. Like, if you're new, you're like, dude, seriously, can we, like, skip out of here? We'll get to Golden Corral for the rest of the Methodists do. No, listen to me. <laughs> listen to me. Man, this is so very, very important from the context of marriage that we understand this. You see, sin with sin, first of all, our relationship with God is destroyed. And when we read in, in verse 8 that they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and it talks about them hiding, this, this word that's, that's translated walking, it, it's more than just the action of walking. Because in the Old Testament, this, usually this phrase, when it's, when it's used, I mean, this word when it's used, is not referring to just the physical action. For instance, it talks about David and Jonathan walking together. It's not just that they were walking together. It's that, it's an idiom for friendship. There's a, there's a relationship there. When we, when we read later in Genesis that Enoch walked with God and did not die, it's not that like he and God went out to stroll and he's like, I'm not going back home. That's not it. It's that there was a friendship there. There's an intimacy that's there. 
And so what we see is God coming to walk, to, to walk with them. And, and so because he's, you know, they, they run, obviously this had happened before. God is coming wanting friendship, the opportunity of relationship. And what do they do? They hide just like we hide. Sin leads to hiding. Sin is separating from a God who wants a relationship and has given us the privilege of a relationship with him. You know, this illustration, man, I, uh, I've probably told before, like, I, I am, I'm not that old, I don't think. Like, I guess you're as old as you feel. I'm, a, I'm like at that age where you can't remember what you said, like, two weeks ago or whatever. So, I, like, if I say the same thing, just, like, politely laugh or whatever. But um, I, I heard a story of an old, old farmer and his wife. He had a 1971 Ford pickup truck, you know, the bench seat, and they're driving down back country road one day and not saying anything. And all of a sudden, man, this, this convertible comes flying up behind them, passes them, you know, dust, gravel everywhere. And, and they're just, you know, they're just maintaining their speed. And they look, and finally the dust settles down, and they can see that in the convertible, man, it's a young guy driving. He has one hand on the steering wheel, his other arm's here, and, and his, his, his girlfriend or wife just nestled right there under his arm. And, and the wife from the other side of the truck says, you know, I remember when we used to do that. And her husband didn't say, didn't say much for a while. He just looked straight ahead. And then he just simply said, I didn't move. <laughs> I think a lot of times we're like, where did God go? Why is there this distance? And God's like, I didn't move. You see, what we do is when we sin, it's not my fault, it's their fault. It's a, we, we run and we hide. And the reason we hide, the reason we run is because we don't want to be reminded because you cannot interact with God and give him those, those excuses because he will see through them. You see, God, uh, the, the God that we serve, our Father, is, is a God who makes covenants with his kids. He makes covenants with his people and we don't like covenants. We don't like commitments. Like, like if I ask, how many of you would be committed to do something? Like, like a lot of you are like, I, I, don't, I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't want to make a commitment. We don't like making commitment. But especially we don't like making commitment where we have to bow the knee. And so we run and our sin separates. But here's, here's the thing. It's not just that our relationship with God is destroyed. Our relationship with ourselves is destroyed. You see, when God asks that question, where are you? And Adam responded, and he said, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He, he, he was speaking of something. I want to come back to this whole naked thing. Because la last week we were talking about how nakedness in the Old Testament, about the only place it's used in a positive context, is, is in verse 25 of chapter 2. And the reason why it's there is because sin has not entered the picture. You see, just like walking is an idiom for, for a relationship, nakedness in the Old Testament is usually an idiom for shame, and so when, when Adam says, you know, I was ashamed, I hid myself, it's, it's, it's more than just like, hey, I got caught with my, clo my clothes off. That's not it whatsoever. He, he felt this need to run, to hide. I need to keep you from seeing who I really am because now I see I'm naked, but I can't admit this to myself. And so what we try to do is we try, we try to lie to God. We try to lie to, to the other person. Can I tell you, nobody's lied to you more than you've lied to you. We lie to ourselves. And so there's this weird part where we can't even be true to who we are. We have to hide. And there's hiding that's going on. Listen, in this treasure valley, there are families that are under, under attack. For the last couple of years, I've sat down with, with community leader after community leader, uh, parachurch organization uh, leaders, pastors, all that. And I'm asking the same questions. What are the needs that exist in our congregation? And by far, the one that comes to the top is we have dysfunction in our families. And it's because we're hiding we're hiding things that happened in the past. We're hiding things that are happening now. Like right now, man, we're, we, we have to hide like bank statements. We have to, we have to hide text threads. We have to hide and get rid of our, of our uh, internet, our browsing history. There's shame. And we're lying to ourselves. It's not my fault. It's nobody else's fault. We're hiding. And, and it's crazy that Adam and Eve, they, 
They, they saw their condition and they're like, I gotta, we gotta fix this. And it says they get fig leaves and they sow fig leaves together. Fig leaves really aren't gonna do much. Like if you show up next week wearing fig leaves, just don't, I'm just telling you. Like, and this is what happens when we try to cover ourselves. We try to cover things up. And, and, and our issue is that we don't have intimacy in our families, in our marriages, because we're hiding. It's impacting and destroying our relationship with God. It's destroying our relationship with, with, with ourselves. But obviously, we also see this. Our relationship with each other is also destroyed. And when we sin or we're hiding in sin, our relationship is no longer about love. It's about power. And man, I, I read, I come back here, I read the curse. There's the curse to the serpent. I'm going I'm to come back to that in just a second. But, but I look at the curse in verse 16 to Eve. To the woman, God said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. I like the clarity of the New, New Living Translation. It translates this verse to read, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And I, I want to just hit something that is not popular at all in this day and age. But church, I want to... If you're new to grace, one of our core values is the authority of the word of God. God's word trumps my feelings. And I say that carefully, not, not flippantly at all. We cannot view the word through the lens of culture. We must view culture through the lens of the word of God. Amen. But I want to come back to this, this whole thing. There, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, it's a beautiful, beautiful laying out of God's plan for marriage. Um, it's a beautiful picture of, of a mutual honor and love within the context of marriage. But, but, but the Apostle Paul has to address an issue that, that exists not just then, it exists today when he writes, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And what, what I know is that much of what we see in our families today is because we have this natural, sinful default to push back against respecting each other, the wife submitting and the husband loving. Now, we can all agree that a lot of the issues that we see, especially when it comes to the negative connotations about the idea of submitting to your husband in marriage, comes about because there are self-centered, carnal, jacked-up men who treat their wives like property, and, and they've missed out on this whole thing, loving them as Christ loves the church. And so I just want to say that, that when, I'm talking about, when I'm talking about submission, it is not this thing where you have to, as, 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 as a wife, you have to have an inferiority, inferiority complex to your husband. Because let's just be honest, guys, we, most of us married up. Can we just admit to that? We married up. But I, I want us, I want us to, to think about this because to understand what Paul is saying. We've seen a lot of unhealthy examples of, of, of this whole submission motif. He does not say, wives submit to men. That's, that's jacked up. Like, if that's your interpretation, stop right there and, and let's, let's bring it in. First of all, it starts within the home. But then it's qualified by this. Submit as to the Lord. And long before Paul wrote these words to husbands and wives, he learned what it meant to be submissive to Jesus. And can I tell you, husbands and wives, before we can truly understand what mutual honor, love, and respect looks like within a marriage, we have to understand what it means to be submissive to Jesus. It has nothing to do, when, the, when I talk about this, this call to biblical submission, it has nothing to do with being demeaned, with being devalued, being stepped on, pushed down, condescended to, not at all. It has everything to do with following the lead of a husband, a groom, who is pursuing, protecting, and loving his wife. 
Biblical submission is not about making yourself less than your husband. It's about willingly following the lead of your husband as he follows Christ. Biblical submission is not about submitting your natural wit, wisdom, personality, or anything like that. It's about leveraging your giftedness in a God-honoring way. Now, church, I'm preaching right here. This is, this is good stuff right here. It's not about allowing your husband to be a slave master. That's not what Paul was talking about. It's about realizing that your husband is going to be accountable to God one day for how he led his family, and that matters. And guys, I want you to listen to me. You and I, we're going to stand before God one day, and we will give an account for how we led our families for Christ. We have been given the responsibility as priests of our homes. We lead our, we're either leading our families for Christ or we're not. There is no middle ground. And so, so, so men, listen to me. It's time for us to grow up and stop being boys. You did not marry another mama who's here to take care of you. God has called you to lead your home for Christ. And if, 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 if you have had the blessing of bringing children into this world, you are called to father them following the example of Christ. And when we are challenged to sacrificially love our wives, it's within the context of Christ's relationship for his church. You lay down your life for your church. Sacrificial love is meeting the needs of your bride, even if, I would even say especially if, your, your needs are being unmet. You're like, well, that's, that's not fair. That's exactly right. That's why, that's why we call it sacrificial. It's not a give and take. It's serving even the mundane without keeping score. Well, I did, man, I tell you what, I do everything around us. No, it's, 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 it's serving without keeping score. It compels to give even when it gets tough. Sacrificial love compels us to do anything and everything we can to protect the bride God has given us. We love her to the point of laying down our lives. And you're like, you don't know my wife. I'm married crazy. <laughs> so did Jesus. Don't tell me the bride of Christ has been easy to love across the years. Don't tell me that because all through scripture, what, you want to see God's people doing? Running, hiding. Jesus married crazy. And if you married crazy, it might be because you drove them crazy. I'm just saying. <laughs> now, my, my, my point here. My point here is this, we are called to mutual honor and respect within our marriages and what I know is that sin destroys this. We become combatants instead of partners. The wife desires to control her husband which is antithesis to respect and submission. The husband desires to dominate his wife which is antithesis to sacrificial love. And the result of this we see those sins that have fractured our marriages. The fights, the passive aggressiveness, the anger. Listen to me, you can say they're the enemy. Can we just own it? The problem is sin. You're like, man, dude. What's going on? Okay, let me sum this up. I got one final point. You're like, dude, he's going to have to like, really get somewhere. It's important that we understand the heart of sin, the width and the depth of sin. But church, here's what I love. For every, every marriage, every family, listen to me. I want to introduce this incredible solution. No, no silver bullet, but this is the solution. This is where it stops. There, I want you to understand the end of sin. I want you to understand the end of sin because what I see in, in Genesis chapter three is not a God who nukes the garden to eradicate sinners, not at all. He doesn't come in with a heavy hand. You know what he does? He comes in and he asks questions. Our issue, and, and when we start fighting, is we make accusations. Why don't you start asking questions? What God is doing here, he's having an intervention. You know what an intervention is, right? It's when people who love and care for A person who is, they just can't get out of whatever they're in. They come in and they ask really tough questions. And they promise to be there through thick and thin, but they say, you've got to do, you've got to, you've got to get help. And and God comes in, he doesn't treat them like like kids or like animals. Treats them like adults. He, He asks questions, but what he does is he leads them to where they have to go. There has to come a point where they own their sin. 
And for the dysfunction in our marriages, we have to come to a place where we own our sin. And I see the mercy of God in two ways. I see the mercy of his heart, the fact that, that he lovingly guides them through this, but while at the same time, he, he does not, he, there, there, has, and there, there has to be consequences. There's a curse. We, we see this. But it's, it's not just that. It goes, it goes beyond that. We see in verse 21 that the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and he clothed them. This is crazy. He didn't just pronounce the curse. He did something about this. And I see the mercy of his hand. He clothed them. He covers their shame. But he doesn't stop there. If you're, not, if you're not paying close attention, you might miss the promise that he gives after the curse and the serpent. It's not just that he clothed them. And by the way, man, there's like a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not going to dig into that. But this is pretty stinking awesome where he, he digs into this. And if you dig into this, what you see is this is the first time there had to be death. An animal had to die for, for the skin's for, for them to be clothed. And there's a whole foreshadowing thing of, of, of sacrifice and all that. But then I, I, I look at what we might miss when he curses the serpent in verse 15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And what we're reading here is a promise for their spiritual healing because there is a promise that's here. A human is later going to do what Adam should have done. He's going to crush the head of the serpent and he's going to destroy sin and death. This is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming. Within the context of marriage, not only do we see the first sin, within the context of marriage, we see the first promise of a Messiah. We can be healed. We can be forgiven. Our marriages can be healed. The fighting, the sin that separates, it can be. We can see sin destroyed once and for all. This is the hope of sin being ended. But here's the crazy thing. Like you get to the end of Genesis chapter three, the very last verse, is, it's like crazy. 24, he drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And you're like, well, man, hold on a second. That's kind of dark, though. Adam and Eve are driven from paradise. And this, this, there's a sword, this flaming sword that, that, that turns every way. And it's, it's a reminder of what Paul talks about later in Romans chapter 3. The wages of sin is death. What we see is it's the justice of God at work. But I want you to listen to me. He said the, 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 the flaming sword, it turned every way to make sure that nobody could get back to the tree. Which means that there, there, it's impossible for you and I to get back to paradise. It can't happen. It won't happen. We can't get past the sword. And yet this incredible promise of Genesis 3.15 is later fulfilled when Jesus Christ comes. And in essence, what he did was he went under the sword. Listen, the sword slew him. And it's by his blood that we can now enter in, that we can be forgiven, we can be healed, that we can have life abundantly, that, listen, we can have the anticipation of what we read in the, the, the last marriage recorded in Scripture, Revelation chapter 22, the marriage supper of the Lamb, when paradise is again found. Jesus did this, and the only thing that turns the curse and brings healing to our marriage is that allows for love instead of power is the gospel and what Jesus Christ did for us. In fact, I'm going to leave you with my big point. Normally, I give it to you at the beginning. I just want to leave you with this. God's merciful intervention is the healing hope of a fractured marriage. I would even add to that a fractured family, a fractured friendship. It's God's merciful intervention. Yes, yes, the first sin so in the context of marriage. But the promise of a Messiah was also given within marriage. We can be healed. Where does it start? Guys, we gotta get to the heart of this. We have to own our sin. It starts with me. We own our sin, we repent of our sin, and we're forgiven of our sin. Is there a magic bullet? No, like, like, it's not like I'm going to watch a video of P90X and all of a sudden, man, I'm, I'm ready to roll. Ain't going to happen. But listen to me. It's the beginning of the journey. It's the solution for the problem. 
And as we agree with God, it's amazing what God can do. And so God, I know that you're not done with our families. You're not God, God, you're not done with our marriages. God, you're not done with us. And Father, before we ever are gonna see healing within our marriages, there has to be healing within us. Dear God, we have to have our relationship with you restored. We have to have our relationship with ourselves restored. And God, thanks to the incredible work of, of your forgiveness, your incredible grace and your love, our relationship with each other can be restored. And so Lord, I'm praying that for each person that's under the sound of my voice, God, it's kind of like one of those things where you don't, you don't ask for an invitation because everybody's like, oh, so they're having problems with their marriage. God, that's, I know that's not what we're about. But God, just like you had an intervention with Adam and Eve, I'm praying that you would have an intervention with every one of us. And God, that we would respond. So God, thank you for what you're going to do to heal our marriages, our families, our relationships. God, I have a feeling that what we have in store of us until Jesus tarries is, is more exciting than not. It's going to be hard. But it's going to be good. Thank you, God, that the best is yet to come. And I pray this in Jesus' strong name. And everybody said? Amen. So good to have you guys here. Don't forget on your way out, grab a card, drop it off here at the church Wednesday. Man, we can't wait to see what God has in store. We'll see you next week. You're dismissed. <laughs>